Hello, this is Dr. Hannah Asil, and today we are talking about Unit 3 in the Chemistry at Excel uh, IAS. Uh, here we're talking about all the experimental techniques and the information that you need to answer the questions in Unit 3. So, basic information, you should remember the names of the apparatus, you should remember this is actually a mortar and pestle the bowl itself is the mortar and the pestle is the handle and of course it is used for crushing solids uh, this one is a crucible and lid we use it to heat something like magnesium for example in air um, this evaporating dish usually we use it to do uh, crystallization if you want to get crystals out of uh, a solution this, of course, is a burette, and you should know that the burette is a very accurate method of getting the volume of a liquid. Uh, this is a pipette. This also is accurate, but it doesn't have any graduation, so it measures the volume exactly of a specific volume, for example, 25 uh, centimeter cubed. Uh, this is a stand that we use to hold the burettes. Um, these are tongues to hold a hot uh, crucible or a hot evaporating dish. Uh, these are funnels that we put on top of the flask. If it doesn't have a, a tap, then it is a thistle funnel. If it has a tap, it is called a dropping funnel or a tap funnel. Uh, this one is a separating funnel or we refer to it as a separatory funnel this is used to separate immiscible liquids so if i have two liquids one of them is aqueous solution and the other is um, a solution of an organic compound then uh, the lighter the one with lower density will float on top the one with higher density will float down and then we open the tap and we can put them into uh, separate um, containers. This one is a volumetric flask and we use it to uh, prepare a solution with a specific concentration and a specific volume. This is a U-tube in which we could put something like a drying agent, uh, pass the gas through it to dry it, for example. Reminding you again, important safety precautions in the lab. We said if we're heating something that's flammable, like ethanol, we should heat in a hot water bath. We cannot put the ethanol near an open flame or it will catch fire. If we're doing an experiment that is producing gases, then we have to do the experiment in a fume cupboard. So this is a fume cupboard with a door in which I can just put my hand below the door and we can close this. It is usually attached to a chimney that will suck up any harmful gases. So we use the fume cupboard if the experiment involves gases, whether I'm using them to react or the experiment is giving out a gas. If we have a hot object, we should hold it with tongues to avoid burning your hand. We are supposed to wear safety glasses at all times to avoid splashes in the eyes. And we wear gloves when handling something that is corrosive. So if we're working with acids or bases, they are corrosive, they're harmful to the skin. So we need to wear gloves. These are basic, you probably know from O level, but we're just reviewing them very quickly. To improve the accuracy of results in an experiment, we said the easiest thing would be Repeat each reading three times and obtain an average result, which is usually more accurate. Well, if he's saying, how do we improve the accuracy? I can take a look at what he's using for measuring volumes of liquids, for example. So if he's using a measuring cylinder, then I should say, no, don't use a measuring cylinder. Replace it by a burette. Measuring volumes of gases, we should use a gas syringe because the gas syringe will give a more accurate uh, volume of gas. When drying a solid, we usually dry between filter paper. Or we can put it in something called a desiccator, which is usually a container with a cover, and we put with it a drying agent, such as anhydrous calcium chloride, 
that will absorb the water from the atmosphere so that uh, it helps to dry the solid. And we said we don't usually heat crystals in an oven to dry it because usually that would lead to break up of the substance or if it is something that is hydrated, then it will lose the water of uh, crystallization. When drying a gas, we can pass the gas through concentrated sulfuric acid. So if you have a setup where we're passing a gas through concentrated sulfuric acid, why are we doing that? To dry the gas or to absorb water from the gas. Remember, we do not do this for ammonia gas because ammonia gas is alkaline and it would react with the sulfuric acid instead of just passing through and having its water absorbed. The hazard labels, these are important, you need to know them. Um, the most important one is that skull that tells you that this is something toxic or poisonous. If it's something that is flammable, like alcohol, then you'll have that sign for flammable. If we're talking about acids or bases, we said they are corrosive, so you have that sign that harms the skin. Um, otherwise, the other is also you should be familiar with. Uh, again, reminding you when he says draw a graph and you find that there is a point that is away from the curve, it will not give you a smooth curve, you do not include it. So we call it an anomalous result and it is not included in the graph. When doing an experiment that involves measuring temperature, we said we put it into a polystyrene cup or what we call a calorimeter, and this prevents loss of heat to the environment or to the surroundings. Um, in acids and bases, we said an indicator is a substance that has different colors in acids and bases, and we said we have different types of indicators. Litmus paper will tell you whether something is an acid or a base because if I put it in acid, it turns red. If I put it in base, it turns blue. But the universal indicator paper will give you a more uh, accurate indication of what the pH is or whether the substance is a strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base. So we put the universal indicator paper and we compare it to this kind of chart and whatever color we get, we can determine what pH it is. Phenophthalene and methyl orange were uh, indicators that are liquids, so we use them in titration and you should know the colors of each of these indicators in uh, the different solutions. In titration, we said titration is... Um, an experiment that we use to determine how much acid neutralizes a certain amount of base. So we said you should be familiar with how to carry out this uh, titration. First of all, if we're reading a burette, you said uh, you should know that the eyes should be on the same level as the meniscus. You know what's the meniscus? That um, round part on top of the liquid and we read the bottom of the meniscus so this volume would be 24.2 centimeter cubed not 24. Uh, you will be required to tell him the percentage error you should know that reading a burette is within plus or minus 0.05 centimeter cube so that is the uh, range of error in the burette now when we determine the volume of a solution from a burette you read the initial volume and you read the final volume so actually you're reading the volume twice so the overall error in that reading is 0.1 centimeter cubed now when we use a burette to deliver a certain volume of solution the overall percentage error is 0.1 over the volume times 100 Remember that when we write percentage error, it's plus or minus something because uh, the actual uh, number should be either uh, more than what you got by 0.4% or less than what you got by 0.4%. Remember again, in titration experiments, before we do any experiment, we need to wash the burette. And we said we wash it twice, so the burette has to be washed first with water. And this is to remove the traces of any previous solution for which it was used. 
then we rinse it or wash it with the solution that I'm going to put into it. And this is because I need to remove any traces of water because if there is water in there, it will change the concentration of the solution that I am using. Okay? And of course, a titration should be repeated more than once to take average results, which are more uh, correct. When the same titration is repeated, only the ones that are concordant. And we said concordant means within 0.2 of each other. For example, these results were obtained in one of the titrations by a student. And he's saying, tick the table to show which results are concordant. Remember, and he writes it, that concordant should be within 0.2 of each other. So which of these are within 0.2 of each other? The difference between them should not be more than 0.2. So these three, we call them concordant results. When we get the average volume of acid used, I use the three concordant results. I do not include the one that is further away. So the 21.8 is too far away. We do not include it. Obviously, it's not a correct answer. So we get the average by adding the concordant results and divide by their number. Now, to prepare standard solutions, when we say that I have a solution of sodium hydroxide that has a certain concentration, that is called a standard solution. So standard solutions are those that have an exact concentration. And when we prepare them, we use a volumetric flask. That's what we use a volumetric flask for. So when you're trying to prepare a standard solution, the first thing that we do is weigh the required mass of solid using a balance. We use a sensitive balance, of course, so this gives an accurate mass of the solid. Then we put the solid into a beaker, add distilled water, and stir with a glass rod to dissolve the solid. So we add a little bit of distilled water, stir with a glass rod to dissolve the solid. Then I transfer the solution to the volumetric flask using a funnel. So I put a funnel on the volumetric flask with uh swirling and so on and i try to transfer the solution to the volumetric flask then i also have to wash the beaker with some distilled water to transfer anything that is still remaining in the beaker and then i add distilled water to the mark the volumetric flask has a certain mark like the pipette and when you fill it to that mark the meniscus is at that mark then we have an exact volume with an exact mass. So this solution that is now prepared in the volumetric flask is called a standard solution. How do we use titration to determine concentration of an acid? When you're explaining titration, it's important to explain it in detail. So we say the first thing we do in titration is what? We put 25 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide solution into a flask using a pipette. Then we add three drops of a certain indicator. Remember that if we're using phenolphthalein, for example, then the solution will turn pink. If we were to use methyl orange, then the solution, methyl orange on sodium hydroxide, which is a base, would give a yellow solution. Then we wash a burette with distilled water to remove traces of any previous solution. Wash the solution with the dilute HCl that I'm going to fill it with to remove traces of water. And then I fill the burette with dilute HCl using a funnel. Remember that we use a funnel to fill the burette and then we remove that funnel. Read the initial reading by looking at the bottom of the meniscus. Remember the eyes, your eyes should be on the same level as the meniscus and you're looking at the bottom of the meniscus. And then we add dilute HCl from the burette on the pink solution until the pink color disappears. Usually when we're doing this, we put a white tile or a white paper below the flask and this is to see the color change clearly. We know the amount of acid used from the burette. This is just a first rough estimate. I need to repeat it again. Make sure that the results are within 0.2 centimeter cubed of each other. So I have concordant results so that I can calculate the average volume that is needed. Okay, in some cases, we do not use 
the normal indicators phenolphthalein or methyl orange, we use starch. We use starch as an indicator if there is iodine in the solution. So if a reaction involves iodine, the indicator that I use is starch. This is because if I have starch and I have iodine, then it turns dark blue black in color. But when the iodine reacts and it is used up, so at the end point, the blue, dark blue color will disappear and I end up with a colorless solution. So for example, this is a kind of reaction involving iodine. We have iodide ions, so we have probably potassium iodide, sodium iodide. We're reacting it with copper ions. This forms iodine. Now, the iodine in the solution, if I put starch in the solution, then I'm starting with a blue color. Now, the mixture containing iodine, if I want to know how much iodine I have made, I can titrate it using sodium thiosulfate of known concentration. So if I'm titrating it with sodium thiosulfate, as I add sodium thiosulfate, it reacts with the iodine until all the iodine has been used up. If my flask no longer has iodine, then the blue color will disappear and I will end up with a colorless solution. So that is my end point. So in this, what if we're titrating with potassium permanganate? You should know that potassium permanganate is originally colored. It is purple or pink. Now, if we use it, we do not need to have an indicator because the change in color of the potassium permanganate itself is used to indicate the end point. So at the beginning, as I add the potassium permanganate, it reacts and the purple color disappears. But at the end point, when whatever is in the flask has finished reaction, then any drop of potassium permanganate into that flask will turn the solution to pink. Another thing that we do in Unit 3 is compare the reactivity of metals using the delta H. You remember that the enthalpy change is the amount of energy given out or taken in by the reaction overall. So if I have different delta H's for different reactions, this can tell me the order of reactivity. So here, for example, I have reaction of zinc with lead ion. Well, delta H is a certain number. What about zinc with copper ions? The delta H is another number. So I can compare this. And obviously, the zinc is more reactive than the lead. But the lead is more reactive than the copper from the delta H's that we can see. And we will talk about this a lot in the um, chapters themselves. Again, when we were talking about energetics, we said to determine the delta H for the reaction, I can do the experiment in a calorimeter or a polystyrene cup with a lid to avoid loss of heat to the surroundings. And we said when we calculate delta H, we calculate first the quantity of heat, which is the mass times the specific heat capacity times the temperature change and then if I want the delta H we said we'll divide that number Q which comes out in joules divided by the number of moles and I will end up with the number the uh, enthalpy change for that reaction and we said that normally when we do this experiment in the lab then the value of the delta H that we calculate is always less than the value that is uh, theoretically written in the data books this is because whenever we do this kind of experiment, there is heat loss from the apparatus. If we're burning a fuel, then there could be incomplete combustion, uh, incomplete transfer of heat. There will be evaporation of the fuel if I'm burning a volatile fuel. And uh, heat could be absorbed by the apparatus itself or by the calorimeter. And of course, sometimes we say that we did not carry out the experiment under standard conditions while the data book uh, values are for standard conditions. So these are, keep them in mind as we do uh, later on, we will do the uh, past papers of Unit 3. Another thing that you need to remember is simple distillation. We said if I have a solution, 
So this is a solution of water with something dissolved in it. I can heat it in this apparatus. The water will boil, um, pass through the condenser. It will be cooled and condensed in the condenser. And I get pure water collected in the conical flask. And we said, of course, this is because the water has a lower boiling point than whatever is dissolved in it. Now, in this syllabus, we will need to do heating under reflux. Now, specifically, when we talk about alcohols and we want to do oxidation, for example, of a primary alcohol, I can either heat it quickly by simple distillation so that it evaporates out quickly. So that is what we did with simple distillation. Or if I want to continue heating it for a long time, without having the uh, volatile liquid evaporating, then we do what we call heating under reflux. Can you see how the condenser is set up? The condenser is set up so that while I am heating the liquid in the round-bottomed flask, if the liquid evaporates, it will cool down, condense, return back to the flask, so I have a chance to continue heating the solution for a long time without having the solvent evaporate okay again testing for ions you need to know these tests they are important test for carbonates we said we add dilute hydrochloric acid uh, any acid with carbonate will give out carbon dioxide gas so what we see or what we observe is bubbles of gas that turn lime water milky we said if we're testing for halides, chloride, bromide, iodide, then we should add dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate. This will give a white precipitate with chloride, cream precipitate with bromide, yellow precipitate with iodide. Again, we said the difference in these colors is usually not very clear. So sometimes we can, in most cases actually, we cannot tell if this precipitate is white or cream or yellow. So we need to continue another test on it. So we add dilute ammonia. Now, if I add dilute ammonia, if it is chloride, the white precipitate will disappear. So the precipitate from the chloride is soluble in dilute ammonia. Of course, something that would be soluble in dilute ammonia would also be soluble in concentrated ammonia. The bromide is not soluble in dilute ammonia. So if I add dilute ammonia to all these three precipitates, only the chloride will dissolve. Now, if I add concentrated ammonia to the bromide and the iodide, only the bromide will dissolve. So the bromide gives a cream precipitate soluble in concentrated ammonia. The yellow precipitate for the iodide will not dissolve in dilute or in concentrated ammonia. We said test for sulfate, we add dilute nitric acid and barium nitrate solution or dilute hydrochloric acid and barium chloride solution. We said we will get a white precipitate. Again, why are we adding the acid? We said we add the acid first to remove any carbonate that may be present because if it has carbonate, then I will get a white precipitate anyway, whether I have a sulfate or not. Test for aqueous ammonia. Again, this is ammonium or aqueous ammonia. So this is a solution of ammonia. I add sodium hydroxide, warm gently. I should get bubbles of ammonia gas. So that means that I will see bubbles of gas that turn damp red litmus paper to blue. So ammonia gas, insert damp red litmus paper. It turns blue. Remember that when we test gases with litmus paper, the litmus paper has to be damp because litmus paper works only if there is water. So either you're just putting it into a solution, so that's fine, or we're putting it into a gas, so the litmus paper itself must be done. Test for carbon dioxide gas. We said we bubble the gas through lime water. The lime water turns milky, and you should know why it turns milky. You should realize that lime water is calcium hydroxide. If I pass carbon dioxide through it, it becomes calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is something that does not dissolve in water, so it makes the solution milky. Test for chlorine gas. We said insert damp blue litmus paper. It bleaches. This is because the chlorine gas removes the color from the litmus paper. 
test for hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. We said if we're testing for hydrogen gas, I need to use a lighted flint. So that's just a lighted match. And if I put it into hydrogen gas, it pops. But for oxygen, I need to use a glowing splint. So that's a match that I lighted and then turned it off just a little bit. So if we put it into oxygen gas, it will relight. Then we talked about flame tests. We said flame tests are for metal ions. And we said metal ions give characteristic colors when heated in the Bunsen burner flame. That is because when we heat, uh, salt, the electrons absorb energy and jump to a higher energy level so they become in an, what we call an excited state. Now, for the electrons to return back to the lower ground state, they will emit the amount of energy that they have absorbed and this will give a characteristic color. So, we said to do flame tests, we need to clean a platinum wire by dipping it into concentrated HCl. Dip the wire in the salt, expose the wire to the non-luminous flame of the Bunsen burner, and observe the emitted light. You need to remember what colors you get. Lithium, red, sodium, yellow, potassium, lilac. Again, I'm reminding you, these are the ions of the metals, not the metal itself. So this is, the red color is due to Li+, Na+, K+. In group two, calcium gives brick red, strontium gives red. So remember that strontium and lithium both give red. Barium gives a green color. And then we did tests for water, whether they're chemical tests or physical tests. So remember that the chemical test is we add anhydrous copper sulfated tears from white to blue. The physical test, I heat the liquid to boiling. It should boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Test for alkenes, we add bromine water, it turns from reddish brown to colorless or from orange to color. Then when we talk about alcohols, we will say test for the presence of OH. This is either I add uh, PCL5, so this gives steamy white fumes which turn blue litmus to red. Or I add acidified potassium dichromate solution, the color should change from orange to green test for nitrate this is a slightly different test from the one we had in o level if i heat the solid strongly it will give bubbles of a colorless gas that relights a glowing splint this is because when we heat any nitrate of group one or group two it should give oxygen gas so this is a gas that relights a glowing splint these are colors that you are required to know so fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, you have yellow, green, red, brown, and gray. Uh, the color of copper metal, we said metals in general are usually uh, silvery gray, except copper metal, which is red, brown. Uh, salts of copper are usually blue or green. Uh, copper oxide is a black solid. Magnesium oxide is white ash. Nitrogen dioxide gas is a reddish brown gas or reddish brown fumes. Carbon is a black solid and manganese dioxide is also a black solid. Please remember this. You should know this from O level. We also did studying rates of reactions and we said in order to study the rates of a reaction, if the reaction gives out a gas, then I could just measure the volume of gas per minute and draw a graph. The graphs look generally like, like this. And we said experiment one is slower than A. Experiment 2 is faster than A. They all reach the same final volume. That means that we started with the same amount of reactants. Now, experiment 3 is a higher graph. That means we used more of the reactants. So instead of using, for example, 1 gram of magnesium, I used 2 grams of magnesium. So it gives me a higher curve. And remember that in order to increase the rate of an experiment, we could either increase the temperature, increase the concentration, increase the pressure if we're talking about something that has gases only, or use a better catalyst or use smaller pieces or crushing a solid. Then another method of measuring the rate, instead of using a gas syringe, I can use a balance. And we said we measure the loss in mass 
Of course, if this is something that gives out a gas, that means the mass will decrease until the reaction is over and uh, the mass remains constant. If the experiment is giving out a precipitate instead of a gas, then I need to use this method to determine the rate where we draw an X on a paper, put the flask on the top of the X, and what we're doing here is measuring the time taken for the X to disappear due to the uh, precipitate that is being formed or the cloudiness in the solution. And of course, we do this at several temperatures. For example, remember that a fast reaction will take less time. So the, as we increase the temperature, this is a faster reaction, so the time decreases. Um, in some cases, he will ask you to compare the energy value of fuel. So if I have two fuels, for example, methanol and ethanol, and I'm trying to determine which one is a better fuel, I can use them to heat a specific amount of water using a specific amount of each of the uh, fuels, the one that will give a higher increase in temperature would be the one that is giving off more energy. So we put a certain amount of water in a test tube and we determine the initial temperature, we weigh a certain amount of the first fuel, uh, place it under the test tube and allow it to heat the water for a certain amount of time. Now repeat it using the same amount of the other fuel, same volume of water, same amount of time. The one that gives a higher increase in temperature is the better fuel. Of course, this kind of experiment, what are the possible sources of error, is you would have some loss of heat to the surroundings, and sometimes this uh, fuel that we're trying to burn will have incomplete combustion of the fuel, so it will give off less energy than what it should have. Uh, the precautions is insulate the experiment. We don't want loss of heat to the environment. And instead of using a test tube that is made of glass, we should use something like a copper can that will uh, transmit heat more efficiently. So, that is the information that you need in order to answer questions for Unit 3. Please keep all of this in mind, and we will be doing the individual past papers uh, as soon as possible. Please uh, continue listening to these videos.